In today's episode, we're going to be taking a slashing retrospective look at the second installment of X-Men. We're about to look into the ass-kicking, crowd-pleasing, money-making mega-hit that is X2, X-Men United. If you're ready to get into the eye of the storm with our beloved team of misfit mutants, then relax, plug into Cerebro, and let's go berserk. When we first revisited X-Men, comic book movies were far from being bankable box office blockbusters. But by the year 2003, superhero action films were bringing audiences into cinemas across the world, and it was time for our favorite live action comic book movies to get sequels. Welcome back. While some sequels in Hollywood have definitely left a lot to be desired, there are a few among them that take the original film's spirit and elevate it into something new. Something better. Is this one of those sequels? Find out in today's episode of Marvel Revisited. After the success of Fox's darker take on mutants in X-Men 2000, it was immediately decided that a follow-up film would begin development with plans for a summer 2003 release date. Brian Singer, pre-disgraced, returned to direct and adapt a screenplay written by Michael Doherty, David Hayter, and Dan Harris. The film's story was based on many comic book stories, but the outline was specifically cited as being based off of X-Men, God Loves, Man Kills by Chris Claremont. Because of the short time frame between films, the studio was also able to get back the core cast for another round of super-powered shenanigans. Hugh Jackman had risen from being a mostly unknown face in Hollywood to being fans' definitive version of Wolverine, and the screenwriters were happy to give Jackman another big role in the sequel. Of course, this would also make audiences happy, as Wolverine is considered to be the most beloved of all of the X-Men in this franchise. But... Oh! You know nothing, little man. Halle Berry returned as Storm, despite having a less than stellar experience working on the first one. It was said after shooting the film that Berry would frequently vomit on set due to the wire work required for her flying scenes. This is apparent as we see even less flying from Storm in this movie. James Marsden, Famke Janssen, and Anna Paquin are back as well, and Cyclops got a little bit of a visor upgrade. Or downgrade, I mean... Look at this tiny thing. We also get Patrick Stewart, Ian McKellen, and Rebecca Romaine back to continue the ongoing tension between the X-Men and the Brotherhood of Mutants. For this film, writers wanted to add more recognizable mutants from the comics and write them in alongside our heroes. The character of Nightcrawler was added, and famous character actor Alan Cumming was cast for the role, beating out Ethan Embry at the last minute and easily stole the show with his debut in this movie. Man, I still like that scene, and I'm sure you're enjoying this video. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe for the best in movie content. Other characters like Pyro and Lady Deathstrike were also added to the script, and both of them really got a chance to show off their mutant abilities in this movie. The movie starts with some exposition to catch audiences up on mutants and the ongoing conflict between them and non-powered humans who fear them. The voiceover is provided by Patrick Stewart, and only he could make it sound so grand. Sharing the world has never been humanity's defining attribute. Then we enter my personal favorite scene in this entire film, the introduction to Nightcrawler. This scene is pure entertainment as we see a mysterious man in a trench coat and flesh tone makeup as he quietly enters the White House for a museum tour. He sneaks off towards the Oval Office where we see this happen. The filming of this scene was exhaustive for the entire crew and actors, and the effort was greatly appreciated by fans as this first look at Nightcrawler in live action form had audiences around the globe interested in the story that was about to unfold. Nightcrawler brawls and teleports through the Secret Service and nearly assassinates the president before being shot in the arm and fleeing before finishing the job. Now we transition to the payoff to Logan's adventure from the end of the first film. It's not so much a payoff, but more of a quick green screen shot to give Logan a reason to return to the group at the X-Mansion. The scene is harmless, but definitely not much of a satisfying reason to get the band back together, if you know what I mean. Meanwhile, we check back in with the rest of the core team, Cyclops, Jean Grey, and Storm. They're on sort of a field trip with the younger students from Xavier's school, and the team is sort of chaperoning. It isn't long before Jean starts losing control of her powers right there in the mall and hearing the thoughts of every single person inside. 
She tells Scott that she's been having nightmares and slowly losing her ability to control the raw power of her abilities, something that seems to be setting up a certain epic comic book story that we would later see adapted into live action. Badly. Twice. Storm comes by and this time doesn't have her Kenyan accent, which she carried in the first film. This is honestly a small continuity error compared to the mass of plot holes that would come up throughout the timeline of these movies. Now it's time to check in with the younger students and we enter a scene where Rogue, played again by Anna Paquin, Bobby, played again by Sean Ashmore, and John, aka Pyro, a new character in the movies, but a beloved villain from the comics, played here by Aaron Stanford. Sean Ashmore must have been jealous of those fire powers because years later we saw Ashmore play Lamplighter in the Amazon Prime hit The Boys. What the f are you laughing at? The teens are being lightly harassed by some mall goers when John decides to take things a few steps too far and uses his ability to control the fire to light up one of the bullies using a lit cigarette. Before any major conflicts arise, we notice that every non-mutant in the mall has become completely still while the X-Men are all able to move freely. Enter Professor X. Next time you feel like showing off, don't. Charles freezes everyone to take kind of a teaching moment with Pyro, but the team learns the news of a mutant attack on the White House and the X-Men are immediately on the case, but not as quickly as the movie's villain, William Stryker. Does this name sound familiar? Yeah, we see a lot of this character throughout the X-Men franchise. But this is the first appearance and he's established in this movie as a well-connected special ops agent slash scientist with years of experience in mutant policy. He also clearly despises mutants and the dialogue of this scene makes it very obvious. While Stryker is discussing his plan to invade Xavier's school in order to quote, investigate the assassin who attempted to kill the president, we see another familiar face. Senator Kelly from the first film returns, kind of. See, Senator Kelly died in the last film, but at the end it was revealed that Mystique had been impersonating him in order to help her cause for mutant rights from the inside. Stryker and Kelly, but really Mystique, argue about the methods Stryker wants to implement to his investigation. Kelly is fighting for mutant rights, and Stryker is seemingly perfectly at ease with starting a war. This is interesting because the movie is kind of setting up a common enemy between the X-Men and the Brotherhood of Mutants. Back at the X-Mansion, Logan is returning from his spirit quest, and he is greeted by Rogue and introduced to Bobby, aka... Call me Iceman. Storm tells Logan that they need him to babysit while Jean and Storm head to Boston to look for the assassin. Of course, they know where to find him thanks to Professor X and his ability to use Cerebro to locate mutants. Now it's time to check in with our favorite X-Men frenemy, Magneto, played again by Ian McKellen. How long can we keep this up? How long is your sentence? Forever. Magneto is visited by Stryker, who's also looking for Nightcrawler, who enters Magneto's plastic prison and gives him some kind of truth serum that makes Magneto essentially unable to resist obeying Stryker. Stryker hopes to use this advantage to get information about Xavier's school for the gifted. Mystique breaks into Stryker's office and uses his computer to locate Magneto's plastic prison in order to help him escape, and the game is afoot. War has begun. Storm and Jean arrive at a church and find Nightcrawler. He explains he doesn't really remember the attempt to assassinate the president and has no memory of anything that happened before that. Storm and Jean notice a raw burn on the back of Nightcrawler's neck, which matches the one from Magneto when Stryker was controlling him. This of course is leading the audience to believe that Stryker is behind the assassination attempt. Jeez, this guy really hates mutants. So Storm and Jean are headed back, Logan is at home with the kids, and Cyclops goes with Professor X to visit Magneto and see what he knows. Is here where we learn that Stryker's motivation is actually deeply personal. Turns out Stryker's son is not only a mutant, but a highly dangerous one that used to go to Charles's school. Magneto reveals that he told Stryker everything about the school and Cerebro. At this point, the movie is begging for some action, which gets satisfied by seeing Cyclops get his ass kicked by Lady Deathstrike and Charles being held captive. And then we get the famous mansion invasion scene. <laughs> Oh yeah. This scene also features a version of the fan favorite Wolverine ability, the Berserker Attack. Let's go. This was a huge crowd pleaser for audiences and fans of the comics as the Berserker Rage is as synonymous with Wolverine as playing cards are to Gambit. 
The entire scene is really intense and they really want you to feel the stakes of the invasion. Wolverine is able to get a handful of mutants out of the school and escapes to Boston with Rogue, Pyro, and Iceman to hide out and contact Charles, not knowing that he's currently unavailable. Stryker breaks into Cerebro and steals all the parts he needs to rebuild his own version of it elsewhere. Then a quick check-in with Mystique as she uses her human form to seduce Magneto's prison guard and then inject him with liquid iron. This of course will be more than useful to Magneto as he uses it to later kill the guard and escape from prison. We now see that Professor X is under the captivity of Stryker and the scene's dialogue is meant to provide some more exposition to Stryker's history with mutants. We basically learn that Stryker's son Jason was a mutant who went to Charles's school but was returned home because his mutation was so severe that even Professor X couldn't help him control it. Jason would bitterly haunt his parents' minds with his powers as revenge for his mutation, which led to the eventual suicide of Stryker's wife. So Stryker's ultimate motivation is revealed, and his plan is to use his new Cerebro while powering it with the abilities of his son, who is revealed to be alive and basically completely vegetable as he's been operated on and sedated by Stryker. He wants to use his son's abilities to affect the minds of every living mutant and genocide them all in one single effort. Big bad guy shit. Logan, Rogue, Iceman, and Pyro are hiding out at Bobby's parents' house in Boston, but when Bobby comes out as a mutant to his family, his little brother doesn't take the news well and decides to call the police and report a mutant threat. This sends Storm and Jean to rescue Logan and the kids, which they do, only to get into a pretty intense jet fight with the military before being intercepted, yet saved, by Magneto and Mystique. When will these people learn how to fly? I love that this story forces the Brotherhood and the X-Men to trust and rely on each other to defeat a common enemy. It kind of thickens the ongoing drama between sides, and for me, it makes the movie a lot more interesting. So the team is still spread out, but we're starting to see them slowly coming together. The core team, currently consisting of Wolverine, Magneto, Mystique, Bobby, Rogue, Pyro, Storm, and Jean, are camping out in the woods and briefing each other on the situation and making their plan. Oh, hello. During this retreat in the woods, Mystique tricks Logan into making out with her by pretending to be Jean, and Magneto makes a forward attempt to recruit Pyro to the Brotherhood. These conflicts definitely made for an entertaining break in the main plot before the big finale. Back at base, Professor X is still being held captive as Stryker is using Jason and his new makeshift Cerebro to locate all of Earth's mutants and execute them. When the team arrives to save the day, they send Mystique in disguised as Wolverine to gain entry to the base, only to immediately start kicking ass and spreading out looking for Charles. While in the base, Mystique is able to lock Stryker out of the control room and he is now running through the base looking for an escape. Cyclops pops back up after being absent for most of the movie and is currently under the mind control of Stryker and as such is trying to kill his friends. This is one lover's quarrel we cannot get involved in, my dear. But Jean snaps him out of it only to be left injured by the fight and causing an accidental hole in the dam that the base is built on. This? Not good. Wolverine finds Stryker, but doesn't get a chance to talk to him because Lady Deathstrike shows up to give Logan a bitter taste of his own medicine. This fight scene took takes upon takes to get right, but a lot of the editing undermined the effort by using so many quick cuts. It's still an awesome scene, and Wolverine wins the fight. Nightcrawler and Storm rescue some kid mutants that were captured during the raid and eventually find Charles. Storm has to save Charles by using her powers to essentially freeze Jason to death so that he can't control Professor X and cause illusions. This works, but now the base is flooding with water and everyone is facing certain death. Logan catches up with Stryker and the conversation sort of hints at Wolverine's Weapon X origins, something that we will be exploring soon and I'm just so thrilled. Oh, that's funny. You're still so funny, Logan. Logan leaves Stryker for dead and catches up with the team. They all make it safely back to the jet, only to find that Pyro has escaped with Magneto and Mystique, presumably to join the Brotherhood. The jet isn't working from a near-fatal blast to the back of it during the jet fight, and Jean makes the incredibly bold and seemingly snap decision to use her powers to lift the plane while holding back the water flow from drowning everyone. She's able to save the entire crew, but only at the cost of her own life. <laughs> This scene was much more emotional this time around than I remembered it being. James Marsden really plays up the intense emotion and it is believable. Much more subtle is Logan's equally sad, albeit more composed reaction. This is some good acting. Well done, boys. 
So Stryker is dead, the mutant race is safe, and the team has mostly survived barring the tragic loss of Jean Grey. We end the film with a warning from mutants to the president that there are powerful forces attempting to start a war, and then a final piece of dialogue from Jean that sets up audiences for one of the most famous storylines in X-Men comic book history, The Dark Phoenix. Estoy tirando la basura. Garbage. I don't remember finding the third film in this franchise particularly good, but I must say that this film was much more solid than I remember. When rewatching it, I constantly found myself engaging in the story and characters for what was a mostly pleasant and entertaining ride. X-Men opened on May 2nd, 2003 to an astounding $407 million worldwide box office take off of just a $110 million budget. The movie would hold the number one spot at the box office for two consecutive weeks before the release of Shrek 2, another sequel that audiences couldn't wait for in 2003. I find that this movie really shines in some of the writing, and the heavy themes mixed in with the eye candy and spectacle of superpowers on display is just great. But what this film really did was set an incredibly high bar for what would be the next installment of the captivating saga, X-Men The Last Stand. But Fox wanted to cash in on the Marvel hype while they were working on the new X-Men, and in between they would give us a new kind of super group. A fantastic group. But was that any good? I guess we'll find out next time on Marvel Revisited.